So I want to give a big thanks to Kevin Thomas for being with us today. As all of you know, he's the founder of the Texas Tribune, one of my heroes. It's very easy to look back and say, oh, this was a project that was destined to be. But actually, I tried to raise money for uh, an NGO uh, for foreign reporting in 2008, 2009, and it was unbelievably difficult. And here's someone who waltzed in, did it, and transformed the face of journalism. So since um, Wal starting- Waltzed. Well, it, it I, have like big a waltz I have big waltzing energy, as you can tell. <laughs> if you were watching it from the outside, it looked like a waltz. Right. We didn't see the feet under, the right. their feet paddling underneath. Yeah. But not only did Evan begin the, start the Texas Tribune, build this fantastic franchise, hire some of the best reporters known to political reporting and local reporting, but he also has done something that I think he hasn't received enough credit for, which is he's been the godfather of nonprofit news. And I am told that you have pretty much helped everybody else that wanted to form a nonprofit newsroom. So would you please all welcome yeah, thank you, thank you. a hero of journalism. Can I say a word, a word about that? Um, I feel like when we started the Tribune, it was really important that somebody helped us. And as much as this may seem pretty mundane to say, I think there is a pay it forward aspect to everything. You know, Dick Toffel and, um, and Paul Steiger, who had started ProPublica a year before we did, were instrumental in getting us off the ground by offering their advice, telling us the mistakes that they had made so we could avoid them. Um, they told us some things, by the way, that we didn't listen to. And it was actually better that we didn't listen to them. But the fact is that we had people to talk to at the beginning. And I think there's a loneliness to this if you don't have people who've been through what you've been through. And so, yes, we've made every effort we possibly can, Sonny, in the years since to help everybody who's come by. And I'm very happy to see around the country, like mushrooms after a rainstorm, all these news organizations, <laughs> truly, that have, that have cropped up in the last 12 years, and in part with our DNA and with our help. And we take pride in their success. Thank you. So last week we had um, Catalina Camilla, who's the editor of executive editor of CQ Roll Call, yep. and one of the very few women of color uh, earlier before before 2021 right. uh, to lead a major newsroom. And one of the things that she talked about was the uh, obligation that all of us have to help the next person over the wall. Right. Um, I, I I love talking to people who have ideas, and they think, well, you know, this is something that journalism hasn't done that it can do, or this is a community that is not well served by the journalism. My, you mentioned the employees we hired who've been so great over the years. Two of them are here. Emma Platoff, who is now at the Globe, was one of the Stand very up, best please. people we ever hired at the Tribune. I miss her every day. Um, when she came to us as a college student, we were uh, in her awe, in awe of, of her ability. Um, and then she was an extraordinary reporter. For, at the Tribune for a while, we lost her to the Boston Globe and back to the Northeast, but she continues. If you read the Michelle Wu story that she wrote today, I think it's the first of many amazing things she'll do on the trail of covering the mayor of Boston. Oriel has been with us for, I mean, literally, we met tonight in person for the first time. But Oriel joined us during the pandemic and is an extraordinary reporter in his own right, covering you know the, the border and border security, immigration, and a whole bucket of issues related to the profound change in Texas. And we are lucky every single day to have him with us and in that, in that job. Um, when, when people come to us and they say, we'd like to know how you did this, or we'd like to talk to you about how you find great reporters, or we'd like to talk to you about how you develop an idea into something that's going to make, the thing is to always be encouraging about it. You know, um, As I said, and as you said, this work, Sonny, needs to be done. In Texas right now, we have 254 counties in the state of Texas. 60% of the counties in Texas have one or zero newspapers currently. The situation in Texas is getting worse by the day. And those of us who are in journalism and swinging hard at the ball, and I would count in that my friend Jasper Scherer, who I think is one of the very best reporters who we've not been able to get to come work for the Texas Tribune yet, but I covet his work and admire him also as much as I can. Um, Jasper knows, Oriel knows, Emma knows from her time here, that there is an extraordinary amount of work to be done, but many, many fewer people doing it than were doing it five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, this work must get done. The state of Texas desperately needs this kind of reporting, and I would say that it applies in, in other places as well. So we have a, a group of political reporters, very, very promising and good ones here. Yep. Um, just uh, Anne took a poll earlier tonight, and half of you, I believe, have been covering the state houses in your states for less than 
five years, the other half more than five years. Yeah. So let me go back to the, the real elephant in the room about political coverage now. Um, the Trump effect has been you know, discussed to death. Um, what is it that you would have political reporters as they come into this season yeah. not do? We're going to talk about what they should do, but first, hmm. what will you cringe if you see us do? Well, well, let me actually reverse the question and tell, tell you what I say to the reporters who come to work for us. It's, it's not so much don't do this, but it's please do this. We say to reporters in so many words or in these words, pull no punches but hit both cheeks. If you're only holding one side accountable, you're doing it wrong. There is a, an assumption, and I think we probably as, a, as an industry own a lot of this. There is an assumption that we're only interested in accountability journalism when we're only holding one side accountable. And the reality is there are good Republicans and bad Republicans in leadership, good Democrats and bad Democrats. I say all the time, for me, it's been easy to be nonpartisan because I hate everybody on both sides. <laughs> and, and it's justified, honestly. The, the uh, People live down to your expectations if you're in this business for more than five minutes. They live down to your expectations all the time. It's extraordinary the low level of, of quality and commitment in a lot of people who ultimately get elected to serve in office and the mistakes that they make become the problems that we face. You get what you pay for as with everything else in life. Um, but I think it's important that everybody be held accountable. And so we try to hire people who we believe don't have bad habits they have to unlearn in terms of being fair, thorough, and accurate in everything that they do. We don't hire crusaders. We don't hire people who consider themselves to be advocates. We wear the uniform of only one team, and that team is Texas. We advocate, in, 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 to the degree that we advocate for anything, it's for the idea that Texas can be better by making Texans better informed, more engaged, give them the means to be more thoughtful and productive citizens. This is about democracy, not journalism. Always has been. We said that back in 09 and 10 and 11. We had no idea how right we were. Our democracy is hanging right now by dental floss. And part of the problem, if not the entirety of the problem, is low information and no information citizens who don't have the kind of information that allows them to participate civically, allows them to be part of this representative democracy of ours. I worry that we fail people by not providing them with the basic information they need to be good Texans. And our voter turnout is embarrassing, has been forever, and it continues to be embarrassing. The one election in the last 20 years where our voter turnout was anything you know, positive, say a word about it, was 2018, the election in which Beto O'Rourke ran for the Senate against Ted Cruz, an atypically high turnout midterm election. We were 41st. Typically, we're 50th, 49th, 47th of, among the 50 states, somewhere in there. We were 41st. I joke all the time, and it's not funny that it's like a great, great bumper sticker. Texas, where 41st out of 50 is the good news, right? <laughs> I feel like we have really failed people in the state by not providing people with the kind of information that motivates them to participate civically. Voter turnout's one way of, of that. So, so back to the original question about what we tell reporters to do or not do. There is so much important work to be done. Stay focused on it. Always uphold the values of our mission. Um, Fair, thorough, and accurate at all times. Um, and, and don't act like you have a side that you're on. Don't wear the red uniform or the blue uniform. Um, and, and, and demonstrate your seriousness uh, in all the work that you do. Let's talk for a minute about um, political journalism in this age of um, disintermediation. Yeah. Does it still matter? How does it matter? If, if everyone can get the news directly, right. then what is the role now of a political journalist? Well, we, we provide, first of all, I would politely uh, disagree with the premise that you can get the information without us. Look, elected officials think that they can provide information without going through us. That was not the case once upon a time. They've all created their own channels. Elected officials have created ways to get to the people they want to reach, cutting us out of the equation. They are gleeful in refusing to talk to us along that continuum. Also, these bullshit news sites that have started up around the country, Texas and elsewhere, that purport to be independent but are clearly partisan, funded by people who have an agenda, often associated with the very same elected officials. You know, when you know, a reporter from one of these news sites profiles our Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, one of the people who has largely decided to stop talking to the press on a regular basis. And the first question that reporter asks is, why are you so awesome? 
and it's downhill from there. You know what you're getting, right? <laughs> this, this is unfortunately a feature of the relationship between the media in a place like Texas at the moment and people in leadership. They've made the decision that they can cut us out of the equation, largely. We will continue, rest assured, we will do our jobs anyway. They cannot deter us. We will still hold them accountable. But the nature of the relationship has changed. Um, I do think that that's one of the things that we have not done a good enough job yet of solving for. How do you provide clarity to the average person who's not sophisticated enough to understand that a direct communication from an elected official or something that they read online is not necessarily accountability and explanatory journalism of the kind that we and other independent news organizations produce. There's a distinction. Media literacy is not sufficiently at a level where people make those decisions or can make that, sort that out themselves. We have to do better at that, helping people understand the difference. But it is definitely a challenge. Um, here's an example. I'll give you a specific example. And it's something that Oriel knows from his work with us and, and his colleagues at the Tribune, that Jasper knows, and, and others know. There is a, an initiative that the governor of our state is largely responsible for, not expressly, but largely responsible for, called Operation Lone Star, in which members of our National Guard have been deployed to the border to solve this border crisis that we have in the state of Texas. Is there an issue on the border? Yes. Has this in any way solved the problem? No. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of our reporting, which has done, I think, wonders over the last several months in calling out what is largely a fabricated victory lap on the part of our governor in claiming all these arrests and all these you know, efforts to stem this flow of people coming across uh, unlawfully, um, the data does not back up remotely what the governor and his allies have claimed on this. The governor says, I, I, I have every right to claim victory on this, and I'm going to tell the reporter from Breitbart what a success this thing is. And now I've talked to the, having given the interview to the reporter from Breitbart, I've now talked to the media. So we say, well, we're doing the reporting on this. We actually have data that contradicts every aspect of what you say. Talk to us. No, we're not going to talk to you. We've talked to Breitbart. That's sufficient. We've talked to the media. This is, the, I could give you five other examples, 10 other examples of situations in which people in elective office refuse to engage with those of us who are doing the hard work of holding them accountable, all the while claiming they're talking to the media because our attorney general goes on Newsmax, or because the governor gives an interview at the border entirely for the purpose of fluffing his, his victory lap on, you know, to, to the reporter from Breitbart. I mean, it's a very different world. This is just a totally screwy, complicated situation. But again, our work matters, and it cuts through the smoke and the noise. There is no problem in journalism that cannot be solved by more and better journalism. And so we continue to do this work. But it's definitely weird. And it's definitely a different scenario than what I imagined 13 years ago and different than it was even just a few years ago. So it actually goes beyond politics. We're hearing that, for example, uh, people on the police beat mm -hmm. uh, all over the country are having problems because the police department have not only hired their own um, public affairs officers, but they've actually hired former reporters um, who have now become these PIOs who are shooting their own film, who will give you the right. sheriff's statement. And your choices, and they say, well, we've already, here's the statement. It's on video. You can rent it or not. You can quote it or not. Um, but we don't need to talk to you because uh, here's the statement. We'll email it to you. Well, one, one of the things that we don't talk about enough is that the hollowing out of the journalism business has produced a whole bunch of former reporters in the sorts of jobs you just described who have a little bit more sophistication than the average person we dealt with once upon a time in those jobs. And they understand that they can create this whole other stream and they can give the impression that they're you know, playing down the middle, but, but of course they're not. I don't, I don't begrudge them that. I mean, that's the way... That's the way this goes. It, but again, we, are, we will not be deterred. Our job is to hold people in power and taxpayer-funded institutions accountable. Our job is to search for the truth and tell people what we find. And that is the work that we do every single day, and that's the work we'll continue to do. The, the, the conditions around that change, but our work does not change, and our mission does not change. And the, the importance of our jobs does not change. But I feel like 13 years later, it's no less important than it was at the beginning. In fact, it's probably more important. We're, we're better at it, but we also understand the stakes. Yeah. 
So not to put you on the spot, but put, you get one of these the FACO, you get one of these FACO press releases, you get this um, this cooked footage, and there's the yeah. sheriff, and he's made a statement, and they yeah. don't talk. Do you run it? Do you oh, how run it? oh hell no. So do you refuse? Oh you my God, no, <laughs> no. There's your answer, to ladies and gentlemen. No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, we do our thing. We do our thing, and you know that involves doing independent reporting, and you know again, people while they cooperate with us, they won't. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't deter us from doing our jobs. None of the people in this room would, would misunderstand what they're here to do. And what they're here to do is not to run the press release or not to run the cooked, pre-cooked video. It's not, it's not what we do. It's not journalism. I will open this up to questions in just a moment, but yeah. I have just a couple of other questions. Sure. Um, speaking of hard questions, where do you put the odds that the U.S. is uh, in a civil war? Will be in the next five years? An actual civil war? Uh, declared or undeclared? <laughs> and what do we do? Was this the question for another guest? I don't know. Actually. Um, <laughs> no, how the hell should I know if we're going to be in a civil war? <laughs> honestly, I mean, look, I, I do. I do think that the divisions in this country are profound and real. And l let me actually take the. Let me take the thread and let me maybe go in a place different from the one that you uh, maybe want me to. Um, so here in Texas, we have a phenomenon not uncommon in other places, but it seems especially so here, and that is we do not have competitive elections. Because of gerrymandering and because of the complete feebleness of one of the two major parties on the verge of it ceding its status as a major party, we do not have competitive elections. No Democrats have been elected statewide in Texas since 1994. I went into journalism not to do math, but I know that's 28 years, right? I have people working for me at the Texas Tribune in really important jobs who are 25, 26, 27, who literally were not alive the last time a Democrat was elected statewide. They have to take my word for it. <laughs> it's like Lincoln striding the earth. It's something you read about in the history books, right? Um, and the elections in most cases haven't even been close. Because we have no competitive elections in November, because the Democratic Party is really weak with a capital W, and because redistricting by the party in power, done by the people in power to protect their status as the incumbent party, only makes that situation more the case, the primaries become the, the means to decide who ultimately gets elected. The primaries are the means to decide who runs Texas for two years and four years, and we know not just here, but especially here, primaries are unbelievably low turnout. If the motivation is to win the primary and don't have to win the general election because the primary determines the winner, in some cases there isn't even a person in the other party bothering to run in the fall, then you have a tendency as a candidate to run to the outer edge on both sides. So what we have are basically candidates who are the burnt edges of the brisket in both parties, right, running in a primary very wisely to win the primary knowing that that means they win the general. So we are incentivizing people in both parties to run to the outer edge and not to the center. The polarization in a state like Texas politically is made significantly worse as if it's a prima facie, right? I mean, it's like, on its face, you know that that is the case on that basis. Um, it's Clorox politics. Think of it that way. It's red or reds and blue or blues. That's what it is. So are we going to have an actual civil war? Um, but, but do we have a problem that is fundamental to the functioning of our democracy in that no one talks to or listens to somebody who they don't agree with because there's no gain for them at election time? Yeah, we had a huge problem. And is there a way that that's going to rectify itself? No. Like, my, my, you know, you young people say all the time, I hear, you know, my superpower is blank. My superpower is seeing the last scene in the movie, except I can't see the last scene in this case. Like, I'm usually pretty good at going, well, this will happen for a while, and then at the end, this will happen, and everything will be fine. No, I have no ability to see into the future on this one, because I can't see how this changes. I don't see how this gets better. We have a political system that is absolutely broken. Everybody in the system and in charge of the system is responsible. We in the press can do absolutely nothing to solve it ourselves. 
We can shine a light on it, we can tell people about it, but ultimately change in this country comes from the bottom up, not the top down. So the public has to get activated. The one hope that we have to be a positive force in this is for, the, is for us to let the public know how broken everything is and hope that the public steps up and demands that there be changes to it. But short of that, and I see very little evidence that the public gives a shit about this, short of that, I think the situation persists. Will it go to full on civil war? Probably not. But do I think that the polarization in this country only gets worse, not better? Yes. And I think that it creates an impediment to problems being solved. I mean, that poor Katanji Brown Jackson, that stuff from last week, if you want to understand what the byproduct, or forget, I mean, byproducts are unintentional. The product, intentional, of the system that we're in right now, it was that bullshit last week in the confirmation hearings. I mean, that's just embarrassing. Anybody watching around the country, or pardon me, around the world, we, we are so insistent upon exporting American democracy to other places, our democracy is non-functioning. This is what you're exporting? Anybody watching around the world and saw that those hearings would, would say, I don't need that kind of democracy in my country. It's embarrassing. And again, all we can do is tell people about it. But we can't fix it. And you know, I, it's, it's depressing, to be honest with you but it makes the job that we do that much more important. So let's talk about enduring the depressing. Sure. Everybody in this room has to make it to the midterms. So right. forget about the long-term <laughs> structure, but let's just talk ja about how ja we get ja from ja Jasper said to me earlier, he said, I can't wait to see you unplugged. This is me unplugged. <laughs> it's, it's not pretty. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, speaking about surviving until the midterm, okay, mm -hmm. everyone here is, you know, can expect to experience um, you know, uh, criticism or, you know, allegations that they're not objective, right. criticism of their coverage, um, certainly online abuse, perhaps even physical abuse. Mm -hmm. what, is the, uh, what is the advice that you give your reporters and that you would give this very distinguished, actually, yep. group of reporters about endurance, resilience, and, and making it? So there are two big things in there. One of them is the question of objectivity, which is obviously fraught and is a ongoing debate that we're not going to solve tonight, but I'll give you a point of view about that in a second. The second is this, the environment online, harassment and, and legitimate danger to people, which I do think is a very serious problem, and that's a separate conversation from the first one. Let me do the first one. We self-identify as a nonpartisan news organization. What does that mean? It means that we don't pick sides, we don't editorialize on issues, we don't endorse candidates or campaigns. We wear, as I said, no, the unif only uniform we wear is the uniform of Texas. Fine. Very important to say this, nonpartisan is not non-thinking. When bullshit needs to be called, we call bullshit. If somebody lies, we say they lied. Climate science is not a he said, she said, let's leave it there. Like, I think you have to be honest with the people who read what you produce about things that are honestly not up for debate. And so being nonpartisan is not the same as saying we're going to completely stay out of everything. We're not going to take, we're not going to tell you this is actually the case and this is not the case. No. I think the question of objectivity more broadly is complicated by the fact that for a long time people who looked like me ran newsrooms and the, and the notion of objectivity was filtered through the experiences of people who looked like me. Some people in this room know that I'm going to stop being CEO by the end of this calendar year after 13 years running the Tribune and 18 years running a magazine called Texas Monthly before that. I've had a wonderful time doing this, but I honestly think that given the state of things and the world that we're living in right now, it'd be good for somebody who doesn't look like me to have the opportunity to run a place like the Texas Tribune. It's overdue. We have not done nearly a good enough job of matching our good words about representation and equity in newsrooms with action. And I, as a founder, I'm going to step up and say, it's a good idea for me to hand the baton to somebody else. It would be great for someone who doesn't look like me to have a chance to sort through these questions of objectivity through the filter of their life experience and not mine. I think middle-aged white guys have had enough time in charge, and we had a good run. <laughs> and, now let's let somebody, and now let's let somebody else have a chance, right? Um, so I think I'm not really in the best position to sort through the question of objectivity, partly because everything is going to get filtered through my life experience, but my life experience is not the same as the people coming up overdue in newsrooms and particularly in leadership. Now on the question of, of harassment, I mean, no, the, the online, I mean, no one needs to be told in this room that the online space is terrible and polluted and dangerous. And we as news 
organizations and we in leadership and news organizations have got to prioritize the safety and the mental well-being of the people who work for us. And we have to have policies in place that we can activate when necessary to protect the people who work for us from the likes of people who are allowed to roam free online and treat people horribly and threaten them existentially or literally. And we've seen that at our place. We've seen it in other places. And I think that we as an industry have got to do a better job of prioritizing the health and well-being of people who work for us. Um, this is not playing around. And I really do think that I, I believe that the environment for journalists now out in the world is worse than I've ever seen it and gets worse every day. And I think the political system actually is incentivizing the worst actors to double down on, on how that's gone. And I just think it's, I think it's just terrible. And I, there's nothing I can say about that beyond that, and I can't solve it. Having said you can't solve it, um, like civil war. Please don't ask me to solve it. I I'm just not going to ask you a civil war question. Yeah. No, I am going to yeah. ask you a different question, though, yeah. which is um, the, the obligation that each of us has to keep going yeah. and defend our mental health and yet not quit. And my agenda, quite honestly, yeah. um, as head of the National Press Foundation, is that I don't want you all drummed out of the business. I want you to right. stay in long enough to rise, to succeed, and to be the next generation of leaders. So what would you say? Well, I, I'm going to give you a, an answer that you're not going to like very much, and that is... Another I, one? Yeah, another <laughs> one. Um, that, that's, my, that's how I'm going to roll tonight. 35% um, of the Texas Tribune staff is new to the Tribune since January 1st, 2021. We are no different than a lot of other news organizations in terms of having had a profound number of people decide during the two years plus of the pandemic, and in our case, the winter storm as well, sort of like on top of everything else we had that. We're no different than a lot of other places in terms of a lot of people making a decision that they no longer wanted to be either in this job or in this industry over the last two years. And you know what? Emma Platoff can tell you that when it started, I took it personally. Not personally as in me, Evan, but I took it hard because I believe that my job is to protect everybody and to take care of everybody, and I felt like I failed. I failed to create conditions that made people believe they could continue to do this work or that they wanted to do this work. I felt like I'd failed to create an environment within the Texas Tribune that made people want to continue to do the hard and important work that we were charged to do. And after a while, I realized it's not personal. If you've seen one person leave a news organization or this industry, you've seen one person leave a news organization or this industry. Everybody makes decisions for themselves, for their circumstances. Very different from everybody else. Has it been a lot for our industry over the last couple of years? It has. But I don't begrudge people their personal decision. I don't think it is the job of journalism to keep people in jobs longer than they want to be in jobs or keep people in the industry. This is not Guantanamo Bay. You can walk out anytime you want. And I talk to my amazing editor-in-chief, Sewell Chan, about this all the time. I, we say, look, if somebody doesn't want to be here, then they don't want to be here. And we want to have people who want to be here, here, because they're going to do better work. I just think we have to accept the fact that journalism, like other professions, and our organizations individually, like other organizations, this is a weird moment. And people are making decisions that are their decisions. And we have to respect that. We have to honor that. We have to help them. And I don't try to talk anybody back into journalism if they've decided that they want out, because it's a bad place to be sometimes. It doesn't make it less important. This profession is as important to the functioning of our society as it has been in my 35 years in the business. But I also understand that for some people it's not a good time to be doing this work and we have to accept that. Okay, last question for me and I'm going to turn it over. Yeah. Uh, there's been a pretty, pretty aggressive and sometimes very painful debate among journalists about mm -hmm. what constitutes fair coverage, what is racism in coverage. Right. And there's been, I'd say, more than two schools, but at least two schools. One that says, you can fight it out in your newsroom, but don't take it to Twitter. And the other says, if you don't take it to Twitter, you're, you're not stepping up for what you believe. And we have to have this debate, because if trust in journalism it should be right. open, where are you at? Well, well, I need to ask you what you mean by take it to Twitter. What does that mean? Do you it mean that should the, should, the should the business of the, should the business 
of an organization as it relates to these issues be litigated out in public or should it be litigated internally? Yes. I don't think it's my right to tell people who feel aggrieved how to manifest that grievance. I mean, I do think, look, I, this is actually unrelated to this specific subject, but I have this theory of, of what's wrong with Texas now. And that is that the answer to every question appears to be either subject verb liberty or subject verb grievance. <laughs> and I think it's neither. But as it relates to people who feel aggrieved, I, I, can't, I can't tell people what to do and won't try. And if you feel like you, royal you person, feel like you need to take this discussion to a public forum, Godspeed. Doesn't mean it's gonna move the needle. Um, but if, I'm not, I'm not gonna start policing people's speech. I'm not, I'm not. I think the industry has a lot to answer for. And I think many of us who thought that we were good actors and had good hearts and good intentions are a little late to the party in terms of matching those good intentions and actions with, with um, a, a, a good intentions with actions. That talking the talk is fine, walking the walk is, is better. Um, we at the Texas Tribune believe, as a statement of principle, that you cannot cover a state as diverse as Texas. You cannot serve an audience as diverse as the one we serve, and you cannot cover the range of topics that we cover unless the newsroom looks like or comes close to looking like the state, the audience, and the issues. And if we fall short, then we're not doing our job sufficiently. Um, we have prioritized diversity in hiring and in recruitment. We've prioritized equity and representation, not just in the newsroom, but in leadership. Every news organization should be doing that, and woe to any that don't. And, and, and honestly, if you're not thinking about this every day and having conversations every day about this, then you're in trouble, or you're going to be in trouble. Um, I don't have any problem talking about this, and I don't have any problem acknowledging that the industry has not done a good enough job. It's obvious. And denying it would be ridiculous. Of course the industry hasn't done a sufficient job of it. Um, you know, we've been, we've been really good at times and we've been less good at times as an organization. But we've really, I think, we're on the right path in terms of prioritizing e equity in all the decisions that we make, not limited to hiring. Um, if somebody wants to talk about that out in the world, we have nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to, to run from. So. You know, I mean, again, I think it's about policing speech. I, 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 will say, I will say this, and this is not so much on this subject, but more generally. I think we do a great job, all of us in journalism today, about talking about our values and not nearly a good enough job talking about our value. We don't talk about our impact as much as we talk about ourselves at the moment. And I'm very focused on the mission of the Texas Tribune. We have a public service mission. And the work of the Tribune has never been more important than now. We live in the center of the news universe in ways that are good and bad simultaneously at all times. All of us, Oriel and Jasper, Emma when she was here, cover what is essentially an unrelenting fire hose of news turned up to the highest setting at all times. Best place in the world to do this work. Not nearly enough of us deployed to do it. And the impact we have is tangible. It's visible. We hear it from our readers. We hear it from people out in the world all the time. I wish we spent more time talking about our impact and less time talking about ourselves. But I understand how the world is. And I understand that there are people for whom the conversation about ourselves trumps all other conversations. I am not going to be in the business of policing people's speech. Let them have that conversation. That's fine. All right. Well, let me turn it over to all of you. You said, uh, well, my first question, I actually have two. Sure. Um, you said you are not going to choose your, are, are, are you going to choose your predecessor because? No, in fact, I very much am not going to. Let, let me say a word about that. So it is not best practices in any business, but especially in our business, for the person who is exiting the job running an organization to have anything at all to do with the choice of what comes next. We have a board. Our board has one employee. I am the one employee. The board will decide who succeeds me. I will have nothing to do with it. I have expressed a point of view. 
and that point of view includes, it would be good if you hired somebody who didn't look like me. If you hired somebody with a different experience set that might be more aligned with where the state is and the issues are and the audience is right now. I don't get to decide that, but I'm gonna absolutely apply in my own ways pressure for them to make certain that the candidate pool that they uh, are talking to is adequately diverse, sufficiently diverse, and ultimately is a path forward that I think this organization needs. But it's not my decision ultimately who they hire. They've got a search firm that is about to begin formally a national search for my successor. I have given that search firm a whole bunch of names of people in Texas who I think they should be aware of as potential candidates. And I'm certainly talking to people who have called me and said, I know that job is open. Should I apply for this? And I'm like, hell yes. This organization is in the best shape it's ever been in in 13 years. This is a great job. We're handing off a performing asset. But I will not be the person to make the decision. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> I, I guess like my... Is there any worry that, like, at the end of the day, they'll just choose another white male? Is there any worry? Well, here's how I'm going to answer that. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Why? Because that's how the world is, unfortunately. I mean, I, look, I'm just telling you. I think I don't get to decide. I think the board understands the challenge that it has, the opportunity that it has, the responsibility that it has. And I'm hoping that's where it goes. But I don't get to make the call. Gotcha. And... Well, go, please, give example. me your second question. Go ahead. Go yeah, on. Yeah. Um, we got time. And then you, we, you talked about not running a pre-cooked video like from law enforcement or whatnot. Ever. Could, but could you use it against them? Well, if it's full of bullshit, I'd probably be happy to run it at that point. And, 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 and to point out, like annotate it and point out how this is a completely ridiculous version of the facts that is not, it's like detached from reality, sure. But I mean, would we run it as... You know, we want to interview the police chief. The police chief would not give an interview, but instead the police chief's you know, PR person gave us this video of puppy dogs and kittens and whatever else. No, I'm not going to run that. But I mean, for purposes of journalism, sure. Yeah. Can you give a little behind the scenes of what it was like when you were first starting the Tribune? Yeah. What questions did you ask yourself? How did you right. go from just being an idea to a concrete Sure. Thing? None of you is old enough, probably, except for the the people running this organization in the room to remember the old I Love Lucy show and the scene of Lucy and Ethel on the assembly line trying to get the chocolates uh, and they're like eating the chocolates and stuffing them in their shirt. That was what it was like at the beginning. Um, it, Google it. It's hilarious. It's a hilarious <laughs> reference. Um, um, look, I, the, the thing that is clear to me 13 years later is that we had no idea what the hell we were doing. In some ways, I think we succeeded not because we did know, but because we didn't know. One of the problems with, um, with something like this, I think, if you think you know everything, then you don't, you don't leave that. This is the path we're going to go down. We're going to go down this path. That's it. And you might be wrong. You might, surely in a case of starting something like this, there are things that you haven't solved for, things that you thought you know the answer to and you don't. In a lot of ways, our whole thing was, we have this idea that there needs to be more journalism covering these things in Texas. We watched over 20 plus years the disappearance of the Houston Post, competitor to Jasper's paper, The Chronicle, the Dallas Times Herald, the San Antonio Light, the afternoon newspaper, Uriel, there was an afternoon newspaper in El Paso 25 years ago to go along with the morning paper. Now the morning paper has like five reporters to cover a city of 700,000. I mean, the, the hollowing out of the newsrooms in Texas is, is legitimately a problem in ways that I don't know 12 or 13 years ago we would have anticipated that we would get to this point. We, we worried that it would be bad. We didn't know how right we were. The idea was we need to create more journalism, reliable, credible journalism, to give people the means to be better citizens, and we're not doing it in competition with the Chronicle or in competition with the American Statesman, Nikki. I mean, we want the American Statesman to succeed always. And we honor your work, and when your work, and often it is your work personally that is so great on a given day, we amplify the best work of the people in this ecosystem because we believe when the Chronicle succeeds, we all succeed. When the Statesman succeeds, we all succeed. This is not us versus them. This is not either or. This is both and. We need all of us to be doing good work in this ecosystem. But I think we can also acknowledge 
that it's not, there are not nearly as en enough Nickies and enough Jaspers, enough Orioles in the press corps today to do the work that's necessary. Um, so back in the day, we said we need to create more jobs, we need to create more reporting, and we need to create a means for people to get this information. And we, Ross Ramsey, the co-founder of the Tribune, and I basically did a fantasy baseball draft list in the month leading up to the Tribune and said, if we could get anybody into press corps, who would we get? We made a list. We got every single person on the list, which was amazing. And then we just started doing the work. And we did it knowing that we didn't have the answers to every question that we might have or any question that we might have. But we said, let's, I mean, here's how compressed the time frame was, Andy. I was the editor-in-chief of Texas Monthly for many years, president of the company for the last year. I left my job at Texas Monthly on July 21st, 2009, a Friday. No, pardon me, August 21st, pardon me, August 21st, 2009, a Friday. I started at the Tribune on August 24th, 2009, a Monday. We actually opened the physical office of the Tribune on September 1st of 2009, and we were online for the first time on November 3rd. We basically built the site, got the whole staff in place, and got going in the space of about two months. And there was something deliberate about that because we said, look, we're going to have to iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate. And if we wait until this is perfect, it's never going to be perfect. So let's just get going. Let's get our stuff online. Let's demonstrate to people how serious we are about this. And then we'll make it better as we go. We'll build the plane while in flight. Kind of like that, actually. And that's, that's, I mean, I like doing it. There was something exciting about it in those days. It was like exciting on the verge of causing us to all be insane, but it was exciting. Um, we had 17 people on the first day, that November 3rd, 2009, first day, 17 employees full-time. 11 of those were journalists. And we wanted to demonstrate to people, because you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, that we were serious as hell about doing this work, and that meant having enough journalists in place doing that kind of work, so people said, oh, they're serious about this. They actually, they're really gonna prioritize. I mean, we, this was the choice I had as CEO. This is interesting. So we had three and a half million dollars, about three, a little more than three and a half million dollars in the bank to begin. We've now raised more than a hundred million dollars in twelve plus years, but we had three and a half million dollars in the bank. We had seventeen jobs. That's it. Not eighteen. Not nineteen. Seventeen jobs. That was it. So we said, well, what? How are we going to divide those up between the business side and the and the journalists? And I said, basically, we have a choice. We can either prioritize the business side, like have a great functioning business side, selling function, this is all great, and have like three journalists. Or we can just flood the zone in the old New York Times Howell Rainsian way. Let's like have a whole bunch of journalists, and then we'll backfill the business side. And the way that I calculated it was we could either have a great function, selling operation, business operation, and nothing to sell, or we can have amazing shit that we're producing every single day and people are like, I can't believe what they're doing, and then backfill that. I said, totally, we're choosing the latter. We have always prioritized journalists and journalism at the Tribune. We have more than 50 journalists on staff at the Tribune now on a, on a full-time staff of about a little more than 80, going soon to 90. You do journalism by hiring journalists. Can you just have journalists? No. But you can't do journalism unless you have journalists. And you have to have a broad definition of journalists because some of those journalists are traditional reporters. Oriel's got a beat. He reports for us um, on, on our site, uh, participates in other things that we do. But Oriel is a more traditional reporter. But we have people who do multimedia. We have people who do audience. We have an audience team of seven at the Tribune. Those people are all journalists. And they report up through the newsroom. Um, we have a team of data visualizers, data journalists who do data visualizations and other kinds of data-informed work. We have five people on our staff whose fo focus is expressly that. Those people are every bit as much journalists as the Uriels of the world. In fact, I've said data journalism is kind of an out, but we don't need to modify it. They're just journalists, right? So we have 50 people on our staff who we feel responsibly we can define as journalists. That is how you do journalism. That is how you achieve your mission. Um, it was crazy in those early days, Andy, definitely. And it was, there was no point at which I thought it was going to go off the rails. There was no point at which I thought, well, we're not going to, this is not going to work because the place is going to fall apart or blow up or whatever. We did not know what we were doing. 
And in some ways, that was, I think that was the secret sauce. That was the feature and not the bug, because we were not bound by, by expectations we had for ourselves or expectations that others had for us that we were going to do things a certain way. And so we tended to do things often a way that you wouldn't have done if you had half a brain in your head. And sometimes those things worked, and sometimes they didn't. And this is the other part. Much of the legacy press is risk averse. You cannot take chances, even if it's taking chances in service to greatness, if the probability of not succeeding is high. And we said, we're going to fail all the time. We're going to fail fast if we fail. And we're not going to get freaked out about that. We're going to learn from the mistakes we make. And I think that actually informed a lot of the successes we've had since. Jesse O'Poyan with the Capital Times in Madison, Wisconsin. We are big fans of yours. We and we're big fans of yours. look to you guys and try to copy everything you do. Right. <laughs> from... I, spent, I spent a Halloween night in Madison when I was in graduate school at Northwestern <laughs> that I don't really remember. I was going to say, if you do, I don't know if I'd believe you. I think I, sle I, think I slept in my car. I think. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, I've got a million questions, but, but yes. I guess what I'd come back to is... Um, the, the gratification of when you, when you do hear from the community that you serve hmm? that you, know, you matter and that you're doing work that matters. Right. Are there things that you've done, whether it's stories you can point to or hmm. um, like events, the festival, whatever, things, kind of milestones over, hmm. over the time that you've been doing this, you can say, sure. that's how we got there. I mean, there are a lot of things, and honestly, the things that are fresher in my mind are the things that are more recent. The humanitarian crisis on the border and our coverage of that was a real moment for us when we saw the impact of our work and the importance of prioritizing our resources to cover a story that other people, when they were distracted by the next news event, were going to go off and cover and leave the border uncovered. And we said, no, we're going to double down and we're going to do more, not less. Um, I think the coverage of Hurricane Harvey that we provided, and God knows we were not the only ones. The Chronicle did extraordinary work during that time. That's pre-Jasper, but it was great. We made a real effort to... This is a story that we have to own or co-own. Um, I think our coverage of the pandemic in all ways was really pretty terrific. And I think our coverage of the winter storm, I would hold up our coverage of the winter storm against the coverage of any other news organization in Texas. I thought those were all amazing things. But you know, um, those are moments when if you're a news organization and you don't shine, you really have fallen down. It's, it's, it's not in the extraordinary moments, but it's in the ordinary moments that I think we do Great work. We have a governor who's made a decision to investigate the families of transgender children. And there has been a persistent attack on, uh, uh, on gay Texans and on transgender Texans now going back three legislative sessions, back to the failure of the bathroom bill in Texas to pass. And we have covered those issues, whether it's the bathroom bill, the effort to ban student athletes from participating in school sports based on their gender identity as opposed to their uh, biological sex. Um, along that continuum, there are many, many places. For a lot of Texans, this is not something that they think about every single day. But there are communities out in the state who don't have a place to turn for news and information on that subject, that, that bucket of subjects. And I think we've had a real impact. And we've heard from people in the, in the transgender community. We've heard from people in the LGBTQ plus community that our coverage over time has made a difference to them. Um, I think the festival, which you mentioned, has been a, a hugely impactful thing for us. Um, it's a big, sprawling event. It very nearly breaks the backs and the brains of people on our staff every year, but we bounce back. Um, it is the best example I can give you of journalism in real time, live journalism. I am perplexed every year that more news organizations in Texas, quite honestly, have not followed us down the path of doing live events, because in the city of Houston, city of Austin. There are people in elective and appointed office at the center of the headlines who would be, uh, uh, I think, appropriate subjects to be on stage with a reporter or an editor being asked hard questions with cameras rolling. It is no less journalism than the journalism we produce every single day. I know for a lot of news organizations, it's a, it's a long walk to get to thinking that that's part of what you do, your portfolio, bandwidth, expertise, cost, all that after having done more than 500 event, live events over the last 13 years, I can tell you it's got a pretty significant ROI in both a literal and a non-literal sense. 
Um, I'll tell you a story. So there's a state senator, he's no longer, he's now a county commissioner, Rodney Ellis in Houston, in Harris County. But he was a state senator for a long time here. And I was talking to Rodney Ellis, this is probably seven, eight years ago. We had launched 13 years ago, so this is four or five years into our time in business. Rodney Ellis and I were talking about something up at the Capitol one day. And quite honestly, I was beginning to go a little gray on the conversation. Rodney was talking and talking and talking, and I was like, my mind was beginning to wander a little bit. Until I heard him say, at the end of this long thing he was talking about, and that's the Texas Tribune effect. And I was like, what, what, stop, what, what, what'd you say, what, what? He said, and that's the Tribune effect. I said, well, what, what, what is that? He said, you didn't, you don't know what the, I said, no, I've never heard this phrase before. He said, you don't know that we talk about this at the no. <laughs> He said, okay. He said, okay. He said, so before you all started a few years ago, we up here at the Capitol could get away with anything. We could say one thing and do another. We could say we were going to vote one way and vote another way. We could say we were going to spend money on X and then not spend money on X. There was no accountability, he said. He said, since you've been in business, I know, we all know, that if anything happens up at the Capitol and it does not go exactly as it was supposed to, you will have three or four reporters crawling up our asses in about five minutes to point out how we said X and instead we did. He said, you've changed behavior up here just by virtue of being in the journal and doing what you do. He said, that's the Tribune effect. And I went, hmm, I like that. I've always remembered that. You know, this, this idea that simply by doing our jobs, we cause people in office who are responsible for things that affect all of our lives, who spend taxpayer dollars. I mean, look, every single issue that happens at our capital affects the lives of every single person in this state, whether you are aware of what state government does or not. Think about what happened. This is why this whole concept of state house reporting is so important right now. There has never been a moment where the work of state legislatures has more of an impact on the lives of average people in your communities than right now. And the people in your communities do not have nearly enough transparency into the inner workings of state government, given the impact. Think about what happened in Texas over the last year. First of the nation ban on abortion, most extreme ban on abortion. Now, there are other states that are saying hold by beer to Texas on this, but it was the Texas abortion law passed up the street that catalyzed this conversation that will surely, I feel confident, given the composition of the Supreme Court, pour one out for Roe, right? Permitless carry of handguns. Overhaul of election law, not limited to Texas, certainly, but you know how we like to do everything bigger in Texas. So 23,000 people who submitted mail-in ballots had their ballots rejected during primary. 13% of the people who voted by mail-in ballot. Is that the law not working as it's supposed to, or is it working exactly as it was supposed to? And of course, communities of color uh, on the wrong end of that uh, disproportionately compared to the balance of the people voting in Texas. Um, a, a discussion of who can and can't participate in school sports, what can and can't be taught in schools, what books can and cannot be on the shelves of libraries, and not just in schools. They want to prevent us from reading The Handmaid's Tale. We're living it every day. So not that you are telling me, but I say to people all the time, don't tell me the state legislatures don't matter. We have had a, a a master's level or doctoral level course over the last year at how state legislatures matter. And that's why our work is so important. Um, so from my perspective, maybe it is the more mundane coverage, the day-to-day -day coverage. This happened. They're getting ready to do this. Governors sign this. That to me is, is the most meaningful work that we've done. I mean, the big things are the big things, but the little things really matter. Uh, my name is Ricardo Lopez. I'm a, a political reporter for the Minnesota Reformer, a uh, pretty Wonderful. new nonprofit news outlet up there. Is that, is that the state's newsroom? State's newsroom, Got that's it. right, yes. Good, good. Um, and so, you know, as you were talking about sort of where Texas ranks in voter turnout, and you talked about how, you know, democracy here seems to be, or this is my words, but a little dysfunctional. Uh, but the impact I'm that not, you're I'm not going to object to that. Right. I mean, that's objectively true. And yeah. so in, in Minnesota, you know, we love to brag about this because we're number one in voter turnout yeah. election after election. And why is that? 
there's a whole, there's a few reasons, I think. But one do you have the, online voter registration? Uh, no, we don't. But we do have same-day voter registration. Okay. I mean, there, there's, a few, there's a few good things about our voter registration laws, but I was going to say that one of the reasons is because uh, the high civic engagement, I think, is a result of a pretty well-educated population. Okay. Um, you know, they sort of credit that actually to education policy set in the 80s, a lot of investment in schools. Yeah. Um, but I guess what I was driving at was that um, it, it, you didn't sort of like inspire much hope in, in where journalism is going. I, I'm right? not, well, well, I have a lot of hope for journalism. I don't have sure. a lot of hope for democracy. I'm right. not really, honestly, Ricardo, I'm not in the hope business. <laughs> right. And I, and, I, and, and I think that that's an interesting question because when you consider um, that we're doing this in part because I think we play an important role in democracy, um, are you concerned about journalists leaving the field in enough numbers that, and how do you recruit right. new journalists into a field in which journalists are leaving for, for pretty legitimate reasons, right? I'm not, yeah, as I said, so I'm not I guess gonna, my question is, are yeah. you concerned that that's happening in, in, in big enough numbers? I'm not, gonna tell, I'm not gonna tell people who are leaving journalism that they shouldn't leave journalism if they feel like for their personal circumstances that's the right decision for them to make. Also, and I think not inconsistent with that, I have enormous hope for journalism. I admire all of you at the stage of your lives that you are and the stages in your career that you are. I wish I had it this good when I was your age. This is a great time to be doing this work. It's a great time. I completely call bullshit on the idea, not you, but on anybody saying that this is a bad time to go into journalism, that journalism is in trouble. There are more opportunities available in journalism today than ever. There are more places to go do meaningful, serious journalism than ever. There are more communities being served by journalism that has been specifically created for them. I have a friend in Minneapolis named Mukhtar Ibrahim, who is the founder and editor of Sahan Journal, right? An organization like Sahan Journal, I couldn't have imagined being in business or successful. Uriah lives in El Paso. The El Paso Times, as I've said, is in a bad way. This is the sixth largest city in Texas, the 22nd largest in the country. It's a city of 700,000 plus, county of 800,000 plus potential readership of the El Paso Times, which is a Gannett Gatehouse paper. Of 1.3 million extending into New Mexico, they have five reporters. Okay? But you know, Bob Moore, who was formerly the editor of that paper, started something called El Paso Matters, that is a nonprofit in El Paso that covers many of the issues that the El Paso Times would have or did and can't, and is making a real difference. There are now nonprofit news organizations, scrappy ones in San Antonio, in Fort Worth. There's about to be one funded out of the gate with $20 million in Houston. Right? There's a $50 million one in Baltimore that you probably know about that Stuart Bainham is, is standing up. We had $3.5 million when we started. I'm like, shit, $20 million. $50 million. This is a great time to be doing this work. There is more opportunity. And also, if any of you has an idea, there has never been a better time to pursue that idea than now. Couldn't have imagined having an idea when I was your age all those years ago and going out to do it. Emma remembers, because she worked for her and their friends, Emily Ramshaw, who was the editor of the Texas Tribune, who came to me in the middle of April of 2019, I was sitting in my office one morning at 8 o'clock, Emily standing outside my office, kind of looking down, kicking the dirt. I could sense that something was up. I said, what is it? Come in, come in, come in. So I waved her in. She said, I think I may have to leave the Tribune. I have this idea. And she told me what it was. It was the idea that became the 19th. And I said two things. Fuck. <laughs> that's the first thing I said. And as Emma can tell you, that's usually the first word out of my mouth. No matter what the subject is, that's usually the first word out of my mouth. But the second thing is, I said, I, I get it. You are where I was 10 years ago. You have an idea that you can't stop thinking about when you go to bed at night, when you wake up in the morning. And by the way, it's a great idea. I said, take your time. See if you can raise the money. And if you can't, you still get to be the editor of the Tribune. And I'll be thrilled if you stay. But I will also be rooting for you, even though I'm rooting against my self-interest because I think what you're doing is gonna be amazing. There are Emily, and of course it has been you know, enormously successful. She was able to raise the money, she's doing her thing, and I'm thrilled to death, proud of her. 
supportive of her in every possible way that I can be. There are ideas like that in the heads of some people in this room. Maybe you don't know it yet. And there are ideas certainly in the heads of a lot of other people around this country, and there's never been more of an opportunity to start something like that now. So I'm like bullish on journalism, times 100. I have a son who is studying, as Kathleen McElroy was telling our table, my son is at the University of Texas, Moody College. Sports journalism is the thing he's doing. I told him I can't oppose you because it has the word journalism in it. To be honest with you, it bores the shit out of me, but that's fine. <laughs> you want to run up and down the sidelines during an NBA game chasing who the fuck knows who? Fine. I have no problem with that. That's great. But you know, I tell him this is a great time to go into journalism, and I mean it. I say that to all of you. I have a flight tomorrow morning at 6.30 to California. I've got to go. Um, I'm really happy to be with you, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. And look, as the people who know me in this room know, my DMs are literally open. <laughs> my door is literally open. If you ever need advice, if you ever have any questions about this stuff, I would be happy to talk to you, all of you. Okay? Thanks. I hope that was all right. Great.